Hey guys, this is my one year post aortic valve replacement surgery video to supplement many other videos that I've done uh, on my YouTube channel and, and post on Instagram and things like that. This is kind of an overview of everything that's happened in the last 12 months, a bit of a recovery period, where I'm at now um, and how I've got there. Kind of the journey throughout the whole uh, 12 month period. I'm filming pretty much, it's about one week uh, before my uh, 12 month or one year anniversary, so it's pretty much um, one year to the day. And this video, I'm going to try and condense as much information as I can into it. I've got many other videos on my channel that go into the detail in various topics. So I've got my INR videos, I've got warframe videos, I've got ticking videos, but also I've got in-depth videos about each stage of the hospital experience, if you want to call it that. Um, we've got the HDU, the ICU, general ward, all of those are in there, plus I've got periodic videos throughout the last 12 months, so at three months, four months, six months, eight months, so on and so forth, you get the picture. So what I'll do, I'll link those videos in this video so I'll put the links at the bottom and hopefully popping up during this video um, and you can go and see those and, and have a look at um, a bit more in depth about those different areas of my recovery. There's there's bits about workout, nutrition, INR testing, all of that good stuff. If I went into detail in all of those now, one, this video would be horrendously long, a lot longer than it's already going to be. Um, but also there's a lot of detail that I probably don't remember too much or I probably have to sort of write a lot of notes down, just try and recall exactly what I felt my experiences during those periods. Whereas if you go back and look at some of those videos, um, they were quite fresh. So some of the, uh, the early videos were filmed within a couple of weeks of uh, me coming out of hospital. So it's all very, very raw, very fresh. Um, you can tell I, I don't have much colour most of the time in my face, but in those early videos, I was white as a sheet. <laughs> kind of demonstrates, you know, the, the impact of open heart surgery that has for you. So as way of introduction, I've just spoken a lot about my videos, assuming that you've seen some of those. But for, for those of you who this is your first video, maybe you've just clicked on it, um, give you a bit of an oversight of, of who I am, where I'm, you know, where I'm at in my recovery. So I had aortic valve replacement surgery in February 2020 in a pre-pandemic world. You know, COVID was something that was going on the other side of the world. Wasn't necessarily something that was happening here. Um, so fortunate on that front. I had a mechanical aortic valve, so the St. Jude's mechanical valve uh, placed um, in in place of my tissue valve, um, which obviously has meant I've been on uh, warfarin, anticoagulation medication, or sort of Coumadin as it's known in other countries. It was actually my second open heart surgery. My first was to remove um, some severe aortic stenosis that was um, above the aortic valve, but also within the pumping chamber as well. And that happened when I was about nine years old, so back in 1997. Um, so this being my second open heart surgery. Everything I'm going to talk about in this video and the other videos, I'm going to have a massive caveat. I might even put it across the video, this big alert that I caveat my recovery and my experiences have been in a post or current pandemic world. I don't feel that I've actually experienced the world as I would have done had everything been normal. So by that, I mean my recovery has probably not been the same as other people's who had the surgery earlier. Or if you're in a future and you're watching this back, um, your recovery might be completely different. What I mean by that is I came out of hospital near the end of February. I think it would have been about the 26th, 27th of Feb, maybe, um, or maybe a little bit longer after that. Maybe the 29th. Look back on the old videos. I'm sure it will tell you in there. Um, but within a couple of weeks of coming out, so I was still the early days recovering, COVID um, was spreading in the UK where I live. Um, we had the odd case here and there, and it was growing and growing and growing. By the time I was, you know, less than four weeks, uh, four weeks post-op, the country was put into lockdown. So subsequent lockdown meant that I can go anywhere, I couldn't see anyone, I couldn't go to work. So the things that I probably would have tried to do post-surgery, I didn't have the opportunity to do. So my recovery was probably eased or, you know, it benefited from, you know, a pandemic world where everything was slowed down. One of the examples I'll give for that is I actually returned to work after six weeks. So I don't do a manual job. My job would be a desk job, basically. 
Um, but I didn't spend much time at my desk. But, you know, I'd be out at suppliers. I'd be visiting our other sites across Europe. Um, so it was quite a, a travel heavy job, not necessarily a, a heavy laboring manual lifting sort of job. I went back after six weeks because we we're all working from home. I was able to do a phase return. So I would start about half past nine in the morning, work through to half past 12 in the afternoon. So a nice, easy three hours. And then I'd log off and have the afternoon to myself to just relax, chill out, um, focus on recovery. If I had had to go into the office, the job I had at the time, it was an hour and 10 minute train journey there, an hour and 10 minute back, plus a small uh, bit of walking in between. So that would have obviously eaten into my energy levels and probably would have made it harder for me to last just that three or four hours. So subsequently, my phase return and actually ramping back up to full time working, so seven and a half, eight hours a day, uh, was easier because I was working at home. I was working on a laptop in this room. I switch off at half 12 go downstairs and chill out. So that actually made it easier for me. I also wasn't trying to overstretch myself at the weekends by seeing people or having visitors over or going out to do things to prove that I could do it. We we're in lockdown, so there wasn't much we could do other than your, your daily exercise or you go for a walk or walk the dogs. So things like that probably actually helped pace my recovery, making sure that I didn't rush through and try to do things too quickly. So in that sense, it was a benefit for my recovery. So those of you who have had open heart surgery, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you're watching this in the future, you know, life hopefully is gonna be back to normal, back to its bustling, busy self, and your recovery might have more challenges that your return to work might actually involve a commute. But saying that, most people might be working from home in the future. Who knows? Who knows what, what's going to happen? Um, but there's more pressures and there may be more activities that you want to try and do. So everything I've said in my previous videos and this video about my recovery, about how good it's been, is, like I say, hugely caveated by the global pandemic that kind of slowed everything down a bit and brought it down to kind of a slower pace that actually eased my recovery. So I'm here at 12 months, one year post-op. It's felt like a lifetime ago. If I look back at the operation, at my time in hospital, at the early videos, if I think back to the early weeks of recovery, it seems longer than a year ago. I think because so much has happened, you know, the global pandemic, we've had first waves, second waves, third waves, but we've also had a lot of things going on in a year. And because I had my operation in February, you're almost going through all of the seasons during your recovery, which probably made it feel a lot longer. So I obviously went through the, the end of the winter, into spring, into summer, autumn, winter again. So so much has happened that it feels like such a long time ago. And it feels like I should be filming this, telling you it was five years ago that I had my surgery. Some of that is down to how well I've recovered. Um, I've made no secret about, about this in any of my videos. I feel personally that I've had a really, really good recovery. I feel I've had a speedy recovery. I've got back to doing what I wanted to do uh, within a kind of timeline that is reasonable to expect. And what I mean by that is there is no magic timeline. There is no magic date. You know, you get quoted six weeks post-op is when your, your breastbone, your chest bone, your sternum is healed after being cut. Normally you can start driving after six weeks and to some degree, certainly for me and some other people, you can go back to work or start phasing back to work and getting back to normal life. That doesn't mean that at that six week period, suddenly everything's fine, your chest doesn't hurt, you don't get out of breath still, you don't have sort of dizzy spells um, and your emotions aren't all over the place still from surgery. It isn't this magical date that suddenly after that point, everything's fine. It is, as I've said before, in a lot of these videos, it's all part of the journey. And these are all small steps and milestones along your recovery path. So if I look at like where I was at six weeks, I'd started exercising probably about week four, week five, really, really easily, steady state. And more than anything, it was just about moving the body and, and getting moving and getting active. By six weeks, I was out running. And I say running, but it was probably a quick shuffle. If anyone had seen me uh, out running at that time, uh, I'm not a runner, I'm not a quick runner, but it was a way of exercising where paired with a um, heart rate monitor, I could kind of manage the intensity. So I could slow it right down if uh, my heart rate was getting too high or push myself a little bit further if it was kind of a little bit 
you know, lower and I wanted to get into this good range. So, but what I want to say, and you know, I've said before is that six weeks, that running, it wasn't like I was running and I was going at marathon pace or I was, I was sprinting and everything was fine. It was a struggle. And there's a big difference between um, actually doing damage to your body and your body saying, no, this isn't, no, this isn't good for me versus um, that voice in your head that just doesn't want to exercise. Um, I've covered that in my exercise video. So go and have a look at that, go in a bit more detail about that. But that whole period of the recovery, it's not easy and you have good days and you have bad days and you might have a couple of good days in a row and you think that you've actually recovered. And then the third day or the fourth day will just knock you for six. An example I give, I'm, I'm thinking this was July, August time. So, you know, a considerable time, about six months post-op, I would um, work out Monday. Um, so I maybe do some weights, do some cardio, do the same on Tuesday. Tuesday night, start feeling good and thinking, right, Wednesday, I'm going to do it. And Thursday, Friday as well, I'm going to do a whole week of exercise. Gets to Wednesday, I can barely get out of bed. I just feel exhausted, I feel fatigued. I do a day at work, which I find it really difficult to concentrate, even working at home. And you get to the evening and there's no way I'm going to work out. And I'm just sat on the sofa and I'm controlling the urge to fall asleep at six o'clock in the evening. But that is all part of the journey. You don't suddenly, it's like anything. If you were training for a marathon, you wouldn't expect to be able to run a marathon distance at a good pace straight away. If you'd never done any running before, you'd never done any training. The whole point of the training for a marathon is to build up slowly, slowly, slowly to get to that peak. And that's what we should look at recovery from heart surgery like. It is those small steps. I've said in the videos before, rock bottom really, really is that ICU period when you wake up. And for me, the minute I was awake, it was eight o'clock in the morning. They were like, right, let's get you up out of bed, get you in a chair. And I've said before, it was probably the worst experience I've ever had because you've got a team of two or three nurses trying to get you out of bed. They're trying to maneuver you because you've got all your tubes coming. You've got your, your free chest range, you've got your pacing wires, you've got swung cafters coming out your neck and you've got other drips and everything else going on. And it takes them probably about 10 minutes to get you into the chair. And when you're in the chair, it's horrendous. You just feel so ill. Like for me, I was I was sick a couple of times. Uh, whether or not that was down to the anaesthetic or it was down to the morphine or whatever it was down to, I was sick. And that made it even worse because you're, you're vomiting green bile, which is obviously a lovely thing for me to be telling you on this video. Um, but you're sat there in this chair and you really are at rock bottom. If your expectation is by the end of the week, I am going to be back to normal and I'm going to be running around and it's going to be fine. It's not going to happen. You really have to temper your expectations from that period. And everything you do from there is progress. You know, the, the minute you can get the tubes out of you, you know, taken out and you can then get out of bed yourself and you can start walking around and by yourself and you get that bit of independence. And suddenly you do things that didn't hurt before. These are all the milestones that you need to mentally prepare yourself for, rather than thinking, oh, woe is me, I, I still feel like rubbish after three weeks, um, it's never gonna get any better. It does get better, I promise you, but it's all part of the journey. All the way up until to now, I might still have periods of time where I know I've overdone it, or I feel a little, little ache or a little pain, and it's all down um, to the surgery and recovering from that. You know, let's not forget, right, the thing we've got to understand about open heart surgery, it is so routine to those individuals who are involved in it, to the surgeons, the doctors, the anaesthetists, the perfusionists, everyone involved. It is their day job. They see five of us a day going in and out of the wards, you know, not being horrible, but we're nothing special to them because that's their day job. But it doesn't mean that what we go through isn't such a traumatic experience. I think it's fantastic that open heart surgery now, in the whole, certainly things like um, valve replacements and stenosis removals and, and things like that, have a really high success rate. Even for me, having my second open heart surgery, and there was slightly more risk because it was my second time in the same area, I still had a 97% success rate given to me before the surgery. If it was my first, I was told it would be 99% because I was relatively fit and young and healthy. But, you know, it is still a huge trauma to go through. So just recognise that, you know, recognise that you're always going to have to be progressing during that, that 12 months, two years, three years. I'll let you know in future videos if there's like constant repercussions. But 
you know, just think about what happens to your body. Just the real general what happens. You know, you get you get put under anaesthetic, you get cut open, all of the tissue, the muscle get to the bone, your bone gets sawn by a power saw, you get a nice medieval winch thing stuck in between the two breastplates, and they put it together and arch you open to get to the heart, they stop your heart and they stop your lungs, they put you on a bypass machine, they butcher your heart, you know, they stitch your valve in place, they stitch you back up, whack some tubes in every place imaginable, in even places you think tubes should never go, tubes go, and then you wake up in ICU. It is a traumatic experience, you know, effectively you're on a heart-lung bypass machine, the complications that come with that, the issues that come with that, so I think it's it's really important that we recognize that, but also recognize the small wins. You know, for me, my recovery started at home by walking in the garden for five minutes, just up and down, up and down. And I've got a video of that as well. Not really interesting. It's just me walking up and down in a, in a garden. But the next day it was a little bit, you know, a little bit further, a little bit longer, just keep walking. And then it was walking to a garage down the road that's about a 10 minute walk. I would never have thought twice about walking there previously, but suddenly that became a big milestone. Then it was a supermarket, it was further on than that. So it's about setting those challenges, understanding what we've all gone through as individuals for open heart surgery, recognising that we are heart warriors and, and all the other phrases that are used, CHD warriors and things like that. It's not, we're not you know, blowing our own trumpet there. It is a traumatic experience and it is a really tough surgery to go through. But actually the recovery is gonna be really tough if you don't approach it with a positive mindset and have those sort of guidelines and milestones of how you're gonna measure and make sure you're actually improving along the way. So general well-being at 12 months post-surgery, I feel pretty good. I'm exercising as and when I can, and by that I mean the fact it was minus eight last night, so there is absolutely no way I'm going out this morning to exercise, but in general, I'm able to do what I want. So back in uh, January, so this is filmed in February 2021. In January 2021, I actually undertook um, a 100 kilometer running challenge, and it was just something I came up with. I wanted to lose a bit of Christmas weight. I wanted to have something to motivate me in a new year when we're still in lockdown. It was dark, it was wet, it was miserable. It's January. We had a Christmas in lockdown. So I wanted to do something that was gonna sort of stimulate my mind, get me to focus on something. So my challenge I set myself was to run 100 kilometers in the month of January. And that entailed me starting off doing sort of small runs every day, three, four kilometers. And then when we had bad weather hit, and I had to miss a couple of days, I then had to do longer runs of five, six, seven kilometers to make up for it. On average, I was hitting around 25 kilometers a week. So obviously over the four weeks got me to the 100 kilometers. And that was to raise money for the Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals, who obviously looked after me, my first surgery and second surgery as well. Um, so that's just kind of an example of, I didn't think twice about, about doing that. I've gone out and done this run. And again, you know, it. A lot of people find it strange that I talk about running and tell you I'm not a runner, but I really am not a runner. I couldn't think of anything worse than running. I hated running at school. I hate running now. I hate hated running during my 100 kilometer challenge. It's just, it's something you have to endure because there's some really good benefits from it. But there's other exercise I prefer. I much prefer playing sport, but obviously we can't do that in a moment during a pandemic. And obviously I'm limited on my uh, contact sports from being on anti-coag medication, so warfarin. But other than that, general well-being is, is pretty good. You know, there's there's no difference to me as an individual now um, as to what I was pre-surgery. And I probably caveat that to a year or two pre-surgery because obviously leading up to the surgery, I was um, symptomatic and, you know, it was getting frustrating having the symptoms, shortness of breath. All of that's gone now with um, having the surgery which is fantastic but other than that you know if I thought have I had surgery or not you know there's no lasting effects in my mind anyway you know the one area I suffered with the most and, and in the videos I, I talk about it as well well so there's two areas one was my chest um, that hurt a lot post-surgery even with um, the bone healing and it was all to do with um, where over the years um, I weightlifted obviously built quite a lot of muscle up in the in the chest area and they cut through all of that the left side was actually fine so obviously the nerve damage was probably more on the right side 
and it was one of those things that the doctor said it may recover it may not it may um you know the, the muscles and the tendons and, and the nerves may regenerate or they may not i ended up having like this numb feeling in my right pectoral muscle it felt like i had almost like pins and needles um, and it was numb and i could press it and not feel it um but also anything kind of intricate with the hand so one of the things i was doing a lot um, in my recovery just to break up the day was um, like jigsaw puzzles and just that intricate movement of picking up pieces and moving them about it was just causing me so much pain um, and that would go on for months and months and months but obviously it was getting better but when you thought it was getting better then you do something and it hurt again um, and that was a, a frustration but that is completely gone you know i'm able to do the exercises that i want to do i can move about i can run about i can do whatever i want and that doesn't play up at all i did do some extra bits and pieces i was doing a lot of stretching in the early days i i did some yoga um and just really just trying to build up that that range of motion and doing push-ups and, and band stretches and and all of that stuff as well so i think that helped um with the recovery the second sort of long-term repercussion that i can say that I've, I've definitely got is problems with uh my voice um i think it's held up so far in this video but if you fast forward another 10 minutes it might completely go when i came around in the icu and i explained this in in the icu video um i was struggling not that i remember it too much but i was struggling with the breathing tube um i think i was like gagging on it and i wanted it to be removed and at one point apparently i decided i was going to take it out myself and there was a bit of a struggle and um i think i've damaged my or i think i took it out and then they went to put it back in um but when it went back in it damaged um the back of my throat or it sort of um knocked the back of my throat at the time they didn't know if the damage was going to be permanent so so they had a look down there um they could see a bit of damage but it didn't look serious um, but it meant that the first couple of weeks after my voice was really um like really hoarse and raspy um obviously where i was kind of um where the uh, vocal cords uh, two cords have been one of them's been damaged or it's been inflamed um, and that kind of stayed has stayed with me up until now um, it's got better it's got a lot better it's almost the only way i can describe it is i probably built up a bit of uh, stamina with it but if i do a lot of continuous talking like these videos which doesn't help um but also at work if i'm on back-to-back -back zoom calls or microsoft team calls um, by the second or third um call if i'm doing a lot of talking uh, my voice will start to go it will start getting really pitchy um, it will start going really croaky um and it's hard to regulate so i'm constantly having to drink water to keep it um keep it moist and um trying to regulate how um i talk i've gone to the doctors about this um they've referred me to the ent clinic and um, so in the uk that's ear nose and throat clinic um but you know pretty much i should have been seen in december um but pandemic kicked in wave three or whatever or lockdown three wave two or wh whatever it is we're in at the moment um came and i'm kind of now just on a waiting list for it interestingly um i'll put the link in the video but i watched uh, one of uh, joe rogan's uh, latest podcast uh, this guy on it i really can't remember his name but i'll put a link in it so it's there and he actually had a similar thing where his um vocal cords were damaged during the surgery and um there wasn't an op he couldn't have it repaired but what he was given was some sort of exercises and voice coaching to help build up those muscles and understand how um, he could sort of regulate his voice and, and make sure it doesn't um, doesn't affect him. And he's I think he's five, five or six years post his surgery um, and he says he's a lot better now. So health and fitness. I've done a whole video on health and fitness and, and what I've done post surgery. So go and have a look at that. I've been quite an active person pre-surgery anyway i played field hockey i always went to the gym always worked out I, I was always quite active so it wasn't a huge lifestyle change for me to to get active after surgery so i already had that sort of baseline fitness and, and muscle and, and things like that whereas other people might not so it that's kind of a caveat that you know i'm not expecting everyone to to just go out and, and run and, and cycle and do whatever else post-surgery but but for me that was an integral part of my recovery i also use like health and fitness as almost like a therapy um you know weightlifting for me was always been something that i can do in the morning or do after work and it helps just focus my mind I'll listen to some heavy music um and just crack on with 
the workout and just really helps me focus a day or if it's the end of the day kind of get rid of all of that stress so that that has fundamentally stayed with me since um surgery i haven't worked out as much as i would have done you know five six years ago i haven't done the consistent every day working out um all the time so the most i've worked out consistently was the 100 kilometer run that i did in january um, but there's various reasons for that. You know, in the early days of surgery, post-surgery, I didn't want to push myself and you couldn't, your body would tell you off. And then, um, it, certainly in the UK during the summer, we had some really, really hot weather, which was fantastic, but it's not really conducive to working out and, and trying to keep a level heart rate and just trying to take it easy. So I would have um, odd days here and there, and then there was, you know, life happens and, and stuff like that in the October time. But I would consistently throughout that period work out at least once or twice a week, sometimes up to five times, but it hasn't been this consistent. As soon as I got to, like I said, that six week period, suddenly that was it. I just worked out like a madman every day and look how fantastic it is. It's just been this gradual, listen to the body, push yourself a little bit more and just go from there. So one of the uh, sports that I, I played a lot was field hockey. So those of you in the UK will probably know what field hockey is. Those of you not in the UK who haven't played it, certainly those of you in the US might not have a clue what it is. Um, have a look, I've tried not to explain it, but effectively you've got 22 players, every player's got a solid stick and you play with a solid ball. It is technically, by the rules of the game, a non-contact sport. But for those of you who have played it, certainly at the level I play, which isn't very high level, will know that contact happens whether or not it's clumsy, it's malicious, it's intentional. Uh, you get tackled, you get hacked down, you're running with a ball and someone wipes your legs out with a hockey stick and you're down on the ground. You're playing on AstroTurf, it's abrasive, you end up, my knees are probably 95% scar tissue from, you know, cutting open my knees from playing hockey. Um, so, you know, by the rules of the game, it isn't a contact sport, but the fact of the matter of playing with 22 guys with sticks and a solid ball, there is risk of contact happening and being on uh, warfarin, blood thinners, anticoagulation medication, it's a risk. In the UK, I believe on both of the NHS and the British Heart Foundation websites, but it may just be one, but I've definitely read it on one of those websites, hockey is classed as a, a no-go sport. It is deemed as don't play it, because if you get your head split open, it's not going to be pretty and probably not going to be that good for you being on um, anticoagulation medication. That was probably something I weighed up in my pros and cons. Well, it definitely was something I weighed up in my pros and cons for taking the mechanical valve, knowing that I'm not going to be able to play hockey, or if I did, it would be at a risk. So... During my recovery in the summer, um, and this goes back to the whole pandemic thing, hockey was shut down anyway, Contact you know, any sport in the UK um, was shut down during a pandemic. So it, it wasn't as if I was missing out on anything anyway, which was good. But, you know, as the season drew closer to the start of the season, things were opening up again, September, October time, um, the season was starting. I had a decision to make. I had this burning desire to get back on a hockey pitch just to see what what would happen i was even considering um you know umpiring but also one of the other things i thought about is if i drop down the leagues to the lowest league um it tends to be a development sort of environment so you've got a lot of the youngsters who are sort of 14 15 um, and maybe it's a little bit less competitive or physical um and maybe i'll play play there so I had all of this going on in my head and back of my mind, I always knew that really I shouldn't be playing uh, hockey. You know, it's a bit of a, you know, it is a hell of a risk. So I, I umpired a couple of games, got back onto the field and got into the um, sort of the swing of it. The last game I umpired, um, so those of you who, who know or don't know hockey, hockey has two umpires. You split the pitch in half pretty much diagonally and in reality, you're supposed to be quite, quite mobile and be able to move up and down the pitch. A lot of umpires at certainly the level I play at, they just stand there, they don't move around, which isn't great. Um, it doesn't help them umpire the game properly. But when I umpire, and I'm not a good umpire at all, I'm really sort of novice, amateur, um, but I like to move around just because it, it makes it easy. You can see what's going on. There was a period in the game, there were several periods of the game where I was running quicker than some of the players. And I'm thinking, well, I've, you know, 
I've got back my, my pace and my fitness and I'm on a hockey pitch and I'm running quicker than most of the players on this pitch. Um, and that kind of had, you know, set a little voice in my head about what if um, and what have you. So I decided to play. I knew it was a risk. I took a risk. I played uh, one game where I started started on the substitutes bench. So I, I came on for probably about 15 minutes or, you know, in total. Um, it was kind of very, took it easy. Not much happened in the game. Um, it was pretty much um, all over by the time I came on anyway. So it wasn't that intensity. Then the following week, um, I was asked to, to play again. So I was like, yep, go along. And again, in my mind, I was thinking, I'll start on a substitutes bench. I'll take it easy. I'll play up front or play in a position where I don't have to get stuck in and, and run around as much just to kind of take it easy. So I turned up. A lot of the players who were expected to turn up didn't turn up and we only had the bare um, 11 players. I was then told I had to play in midfield. So again, if any of you are aware of kind of football, like your soccer or um, hockey, you know, midfield is where you do all of the running. I've never played in midfield and I've never played a whole game in midfield and I was only a few months out from open heart surgery. So all of these things were going through my mind sort of pre-game and I was warming up and I was kind of thinking, this could go wrong. You know, in the midfield, there's a lot of action going on, the risk and stuff like that. I just kind of put that to the back of my mind as much as I could and just got out there and focused on the game. Not only did I play the full game in midfield, running up and down, absolutely bossing the midfield, but I scored two goals, which I hadn't scored for a while. Um, and for me, it was closure. As soon as I finished that game, having scored two goals, got man of the match, played in midfield, done all of that running around a few months after open heart surgery and feeling really good for it, that was the closure I needed. Don't get me wrong, there is something inside me that wants to go out and play hockey again when it starts back up, but I'm happy it ended the way it ended because prior to that, for those of you who have seen, I think it may be my pre-surgery video, I stopped playing hockey probably three or four months before my surgery, but it was a downwards um, sort of trajectory before that. My last game, I gave up playing because I could barely run around without getting out of breath. I was getting tunnel vision and just feeling really dizzy. And that frustrated me because I knew I was a better player than what I was kind of demonstrating for those last couple of months playing hockey. So by going back, taking a risk, it got me closure. And I'm kind of happy now that if I don't, if I can't play hockey ever again because of being on anticoagulation medication, I went out on a high and I proved to myself that actually it wasn't my ability that made me rubbish the last couple of months before surgery, but it actually was, you know, the valve not operating properly. The three next three topics I'm going to talk about, INR, warfarin and ticking, are probably the most important topics or that are topics I get the most questions about um, through these videos, through Instagram, um, you know, through the website, it's around these three areas. These three areas are probably, you know, they are the, the, the cons to the pros of having a mechanical valve versus the, the bovine or the tissue valve. And a lot of people worry about it. And I worried about it. Before, you know, I worried about having to check my INR all the time, remembering to take warfarin and the effects that warfarin were going to have and having a ticking mechanical aortic valve. So I'll, I'll try and address all three of those topics. And there's some questions at the end as well um, from some of you. So I'll answer those. So I might end up repeating some of some of the bits and pieces. But first and foremost, ticking. I've done a whole video on ticking. Um, I'll link it you know, onto this video, but a year out, just to give you, you know, overview. Again, my views stay exactly the same as they were when I did the video, um, you know, a couple of months post-surgery. It really, really doesn't bother me. Yes, I can hear it. If I make a conscious effort, I can hear it. Um, and by that, I mean that it just, I think it just blends in the background most of the time. There's a lot of noise going on in your day-to-day -day life. You don't notice it. If I sit down and just, try and listen, I can then hear it. I can also make it louder. So by do by that I mean if I if I'm sat down, if I lean forward and obviously the heart's then pushing um, against the chest wall more, it's closer to the chest wall, um, it just seems more pronounced. If I hold my breath, so if I take a deep breath and hold it, you can hear it um, more pronounced. So there's certain things you can do to actually hear it. Um, doing activities like 
you know, sitting, reading, or just, you know, being in a quiet environment and trying to concentrate, you can hear it, you know, obviously ticking away. But for me, it was, I was expecting it. So when it happens, it's not such a big deal. Um, but also it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I, I saw some videos, I read some comments on a Facebook groups um, of people who, when they came round from surgery, were like, asking the nurse where's that clock what's going on there all i can hear is this ticking noise and people going what well, you know that's you now that's you ticking i didn't actually hear my ticking for for weeks i think certainly in the hospital i came round in the icu and i couldn't hear it i was convinced maybe they'd put um, a bovine or a tissue valve in but they didn't it was a mechanical valve um i then you know on the hdu and on the general ward um again i couldn't hear it i couldn't lie awake and hear it but if i held my breath i could feel it and i tried to explain this in my other videos that in the early weeks it was more of a a, a sensation of hearing this like solid beat um you know when you're holding your breath um and you know doing the breathing exercises that's when it felt like it was more pronounced and then it was probably you know weeks after that that i actually started to to hear it a bit more and maybe getting attuned to it but it certainly wasn't you know, reverberating around in my head like some people um, describe. You know, going to going to sleep, going to bed is not an issue. You know, I I go to bed, I read a book, I don't hear it. You know, it's it's just strange. It's there, and I think part of it is a mentality. I think if you if you want to hear it, if I want to hear it now, I could hear it, but I don't. I'm not looking to hear it. So, I think sometimes there's this expectation that. It, it's going to be silent or, or whatever and I think you can just focus on it too much but personally it just it hasn't bothered me I'm a year out it still doesn't bother me back on a ticking it really you know just to round it off it doesn't it doesn't bother me it didn't bother me at the start I've I wouldn't say I've learned to live with it because it, it, it's never been something that's defined me and defined my recovery um you know my hearing's pretty good so it it's not that I can't, you know, I can't hear it. Um, but the funny thing is, my most popular videos on here are the videos of my aortic valve ticking, uh, which is always uh, h hilarious to me. You know, they've had the most views out of all of them. So I might just, after this video, just keep posting videos of my valve ticking, because it just seems to be what is the content that people want. So I'll address warfarin and INR as kind of one topic, because obviously they come hand in hand. Um, I'll use warfarin uh, for those of you that don't have warfarin um, in your country it'll be coumadin or something uh, similar the idea is um, you're on coumadin which is or warfarin which is an anticoagulation medication it stops um, one of the coagulation methods in the blood um, from coagulating around the artificial valve that you've got in you know in your body and then breaking away and then potentially causing stroke or, or worse um, so that's that's the point of it being on warfarin, I can say 100% I wouldn't know the difference from being on warfarin and not. Now, again, I might be one of the really, really lucky people. I'm on warfarin, my INR range, so my international normalised ratio is uh, between 2 and 3. I'm normally sat anywhere between 2.2 and 2.8 um, is normally where I fluctuate around. I don't tend to go below that and I've only ever gone above that once. Um, but my you know, range is, you know, my INR levels are pretty, pretty steady now. And they have been for the last four or five months. I couldn't tell you what warfarin does to me. I don't feel ill on it. I don't have any stomach upsets. I don't have fatigue or, or whatever some of the symptoms that some people think um, or some people feel that they get from warfarin. You know, one of the side effects is bruising easily um, and I've only had that once or twice, but I couldn't say if I would have bruised anyway had I not been in warfarin. It was doing some kind of heavy manual lifting with some furniture and I caught some like just underneath, you know, on that tender bit of the, the bicep where I was obviously lifting something up and it pinched a bit and it was a nice, nice colour bruise. And I haven't had that prior to surgery, so I'm assuming that was down to the warfarin. But other than that, I've done DIY throughout my whole recovery i've put a decking together i've done some paving i've done some heavy lifting i've insulated a loft i've done all of these physical activities like gardening and you know 
butchering trees down and, and all of this sort of stuff and I haven't had any repercussions I've cut cut myself a couple of times um, just minor cuts but I honestly cannot say that the bleeding was any worse than had I not been on warfarin uh, it's just a case of go and clean it treat it um, you know clean it out bandage it up plaster whatever and it's fine and I don't have at the moment I haven't had any issues with it um, sort of not not stopping bleeding and, and things like that so I've been really lucky you know for me there's no discernible difference between taking warfarin and not um, you know I couldn't tell you okay right I, I feel like this because I'm on on warfarin it's just part of my day-to-day -day life and um, you know I may be maybe really lucky and really fortunate but it has no side effects on me that I'm aware of you know this might be this might kind of blow up in my face in a, a year's time and there might be huge ramifications from being on it um, but for me it's been it's been fine um, the INR and getting your levels um, right was a challenge at first in the hospital they start you really slowly they start you on small doses because they don't want to give you a big dose they don't know how your body reacts to warfarin so they slowly build you up and that was frustrating because they couldn't get me in level but if i look back um they were giving me like half a milligram and then the next day it was like one milligram and then two and then it was like it just wasn't moving my inr was like one and they'll go well hang on a minute you know it would be one if you weren't on warfarin so they went and just stuck me on 10 and then suddenly i was in in range um I then came out of hospital, stayed in range for a couple of weeks, and then got to six weeks. And that's when I started to have trouble with being in range. I was consistently, throughout a lot of the summer last year, I was going as low as 1.6 or 1.7. Um, but it actually coincided with exercising more and being more active, rather than any massive changes in what I was eating. Um, so we've just upped that. So with the anticoagulation clinic, we've monitored it, we upped it. So my dosage um, now is 10 milligrams Monday to Friday and 11 milligrams on Saturday and Sunday. And that keeps me level. I've been on that dosage now since September, I believe. So obviously we're now February, so a good few months. And it's been in range uh, ever since, really. You know, I'm filming this one year, so I've only got a year's experience, but with warfarin and INR, my understanding from other people's experiences, the more you're on it, the easier it is to manage and you don't stress about the small things and you're not testing as regularly. So actually you might dip just below two, but if you're not testing during that time, you're never gonna know and you just go just above and things like that. I'm now testing about once every two months, I think it is, um, but I do have um, a home testing kit. And again, there's another video that I've done of the testing kit and how to self-test. So having my own INR machine or coagulation check machine has been crucial for, you know, making it easier to monitor INR, make it easier to manage sort of warfarin and, and things like that. You know, I had a couple of weeks post-surgery where I was going to the anticoagulation clinic. I was getting the finger pricks at a coagulation check test. It was all relatively painless and, and quick and easy. That changed obviously with a, the pandemic and a lockdown, the clinic no longer ran. So I had to go to the city care center where I live and actually have bloods taken. And that was obviously a pain, having to have that done every week or every two weeks. And it, it, you know, it was a bit of a pain to, to have that done. Then probably about the summertime, near the back end of the summer, they had a kind of change in policy. So I used to be able to figure out, you know, when to go to the, um, to go and get bloods taken based on when I knew it was going to be busy, when I knew it was going to be quiet. And I used to be able to get in and out in a couple of minutes. Then subsequently, they'd done something, they changed something, and it meant that whenever I turned up, there was a queue out the door, and you're looking at an hour, two hour wait, which was ridiculous. And that kind of spurred me on to, to go and get my own Coagulation tech machine and, and go from there. So it just made it so much easier. You know, I say I've done a video that shows you how to self test, and it just gives you that peace of mind that if, you know, around Christmas time, you eat a bit more, you eat things that you wouldn't normally eat, you can obviously uh, self test um, and see what impact it's had on your level. So, in terms of like my diet and kind of living with uh, warfarin and managing INR, Nothing's really changed for me. I've always been 
kind of a consistent eater anyway. Um, I'll try and eat healthy Monday to Friday, have a kind of consistent meal plan. And then come Friday night, Saturday, it's kind of like cheat day, you know, I'll eat whatever I want, go grab a pizza, you know, grab a takeaway, whatever that looks like. So for me, that hasn't actually changed. I've been more conscious of not eating greens or, or foods that are high in vitamin K. And not because you should avoid it on that. The whole idea of warfarin is to dose to what you eat rather than eat to eat to the dose. But I don't consistently eat greens all the time. So I'm not suddenly going to throw in a green heavy meal one day and then not the other day and your level's going to be all over the place. If you want to eat greens, eat greens. That's great. Then you'll be dosed accordingly to, to balance out the levels. If you're like me and you go for a phase where you eat avocado every week and then, and then you don't eat avocado and then again for another couple of months, it's probably not you're not the best thing to, to do. So before filming this, I put a message out on YouTube and on Instagram and I asked for you guys to send in any questions that you've got that you want me to answer to kind of give you an insight into my recovery. So I'm not going to talk any more about kind of my recovery and showing you where I'm at, um, but I'll go on to answering the questions now. There's a lot more in um, all of my other videos as well. So first question is, how was post-op for you? How much pain were you in and how quickly did you recover? So I've covered some of that in, in the videos I've spoken about and you know, there's, it, there isn't a cutoff point at six weeks, suddenly you feel better. Some things take longer to heal for others um, than others um, and other people's experiences are all, you know, they're all different. Um, for me, the memory of um, waking up in ICU I don't remember being in pain per se. Obviously I was on painkillers and, and things like that, but it was the discomfort level. It was only really when I went to move around in a bed to get out of bed or when I was being maneuvered in and out of bed, that was the most painful part, but it actually eased throughout the week um, and gradually um, improved in a recovery period after that. I was actually surprised at the pain. The pain for me wasn't that bad and Elements of the recovery, such as, you know, removing the uh, chest drains or the um, pacing wires, they hurt, but they're not as bad as they could have hurt. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't as bad as I thought, I think maybe because I was preparing for the worst. So this next question is great. So knowing what I know now, would I have changed my decision to go with mechanical valve over a tissue valve? And I think this is such a good question because it, it's a decision unless you're really being guided by um, the advice of your surgeon it's usually up to you what you want to go with go a tissue valve or mechanical valve i'm not going to make a video advocating for either or i think um you know they've both got their pros and cons would i change my decision i might do actually and the, what i'll say with that is because my recovery has been so good, if I had taken a tissue valve right now and I'd had as good a recovery and I was all fit and all healthy and not on warfarin um, and no longer a blood pressure tablet, I would probably say, yeah, I would take that. And I would probably be looking at the longer term and thinking, okay, I could probably do another open heart surgery, which would then be um, the mechanical valve in place of the tissue valve. So there is that possibility. Part of the reason why I decided not to go for a tissue valve was because I didn't want to have to face a third open heart surgery and also not knowing when in the future that would come and the uncertainty and not knowing in kind of what your life's going to be like at that point. So that for me was part of the decision, but I wouldn't say either way. I wouldn't say 100% mechanical valve is the best or 100% tissue valve is the best. I am happy with the choice I made, but because I've had such a good recovery, the, the prospect of having a third open heart surgery isn't probably as daunting as it was pre-surgery. But for me, like I say, I'm, I'm happy with my choice. The ticking doesn't bother me. Living with the warfarin doesn't bother me. INR and things like that. I know I'm only a, um, one year out, a month, um, one year out. Um, and there's a long, you know, this is a long-term thing. This is, this is for life. But um, yeah, I think it does really open up the question of if you go with that tissue valve, it gives you a few years of living without um, the restrictions of, of warfarin and perhaps playing contact sport. But, and 
the other thing that was is a consideration with the tissue valve is it buys you some time it can buy you 5 10 15 years um without warfarin without blood thinners and by that point who knows what the technology is going to look like and where it's going going to go and it could be that there's um, an artificial valve created that last lifetime doesn't need anticoagulation medication so that's another reason um so just really rounded off the question i'm just looking at it again knowing what i know now would i have still gotten the mechanical valve i think yeah i think in reality i would have done but knowing what i know now i wouldn't have regretted doing the tissue valve so if any of you are watching this and you have the bovine valve or the pig valve and you know you have the artificial tissue valve I probably wouldn't mind being in a position I'm in now, feeling like I'm feeling now, having had that valve and knowing that I have to go for a third open heart surgery. Because I've had such a good recovery, I feel that I could tackle that in the next 10, 10 years. Have I changed my diet being um, on warfarin and monitoring my INR? Um, as I said um, previously, I haven't changed it. I've been more consistent with what I eat, but even then I still, my, you know, my diet or my food plan, whatever you want to call it, it does change. It, you know, I have different things for breakfast and lunch and dinners, but the one thing for me is I make a conscious effort of avoiding the leafy greens um, and your avocados and lettuce and things that actually will um, have an influence on my INR, only because I don't eat those things consistently. If you consistently have a portion of greens with your lunch or your dinner every day or every other day or whatever it's going to be, then that's fine. That will work for you. But for me personally, there's been no huge changes. I'll still eat chocolates and sweets and rubbish food and takeaways when I want to. Um, it doesn't actually change um, my INR or affect me. So next questions around outlook. Has my outlook changed since having surgery? Um, I think it has. I think everyone's outlook will change to, for the better or for the worse. Um, there's an element of kind of appreciating the things that are around you, appreciating life. Um, the thing I found tough is that I've I've had that sort of positive mindset in recovery, but then we're in a, a constant lockdown during a global pandemic, which brings its own sort of stresses and strains on you know on your mind on your well-being anyway so i feel like i haven't had the benefit of having a good recovery but throughout this i've tried to maintain a positive mindset um, and keep that at the forefront of my mind and kind of appreciate what i've been through a bit more you know give myself um, a bit of credit um, and kind of not be so hard on myself one of the things that has actually massively changed for me in my own personal life is i changed jobs in the middle of the summer so um, a couple of months after surgery in the middle of a pandemic just coming out of lockdown i interviewed for a new job um, i started that job at the beginning of october my previous employer i had been with them for 15 years i'd been an apprentice i had done my degree i worked all over the company i knew everyone and it's such a fantastic company to work for but in the light of day of after having open heart surgery, I felt like I wanted to challenge myself in a different industry, in a different company, in a different environment, because where I worked, I'm not saying there was no pressures, but I knew the job inside out. I knew what challenges were gonna come every day and it kind of got a bit samey. Whereas going for a new job in a different organization, in a different industry was, you know, filled me with dread to some degree, but it was a challenge. And it was a challenge that with going through open heart surgery, you kind of, for me personally, I grasped and thought, right, you only live once. Who knew what could have happened in February? I'm not gonna live with regrets. I'm gonna go out and take on this job and really challenge myself. And that's been part of my sort of mindset change as well. So final thoughts uh, from me, this is probably gonna be the last feature length video um, mainly because not much has really changed since some of my earlier videos where I had such a good recovery. I'm living with, um, you know, warfarin well, managing my INR. There isn't much drama going on, so it's not probably good viewing, really, just me telling you how good my recovery has been. Um, the second reason why I'm not going to film much more going forward is actually because I'm coming up to a year anniversary. It's a year since I took out a subscription of a video editing suite, which I'm not going to pay for again. I'm a bit of a cheapskate, so that's another reason why you might not see um, videos, certainly feature-length videos coming out from me um, on YouTube. 
I've done plenty of content. A lot of the content I've filmed has got more popular over the last couple of months. I think more and more people have seen it, so it's starting to spread, which is fantastic. I'll still be on Instagram posting things, posting maybe shorter videos and, and bits about my recovery. So check out my Instagram page if you haven't gone on there already. But, you know, final things for me really is, you know, just have that positive mindset. It is really such a difficult, tough surgery to go through. But hopefully me and there's plenty of other people as well who have gone through it successfully um, give you a feeling that it's going to be OK at the end. You come out of it, you live a fit and healthy, positive lifestyle at the end. Um, I'm happy with the decisions I've made. I'm happy with the pace of my recovery. I'm happy with where I'm at now versus where I was pre-op. Um, it's all gone really, really well. Um, so yeah, just good luck. If you're watching this and you haven't yet had your surgery and you're concerned, feel free to reach out. I know a lot of you have. You've sent me comments and messages, emails, Instagram, messages, Facebook. Feel free to do it. I'm more than happy to, to have a chat, to, to share more in depth about different bits of my uh, recovery or just hear about some of your concerns. So absolutely feel free to do that. Um, I'm going to continue doing what I'm going to do, you know, continue you know working out, exercising, kind of trying to live life to a full extent as much as I can during the lockdown and hopefully uh, really reap the benefits of being fit and healthy in a post-pandemic world. But just kind of rounding off, just thank you for everyone who, you know, watch these videos, have liked, comment, subscribed. Um, for me, I just wanted to reach one person. The fact that I've had thousands of views so far has just blown my mind that people would actually listen to me rambling on. Um, it has been quite therapeutic for me to be able to talk about my experiences, uh, which has been really good. So thanks for listening. Um, hope you found some bits that have been useful and really hope if you're pre-surgery that it goes well if your post-surgery your recovery goes well